Okay, uh, Brandy, do you want to, are those my slides? Next slide. I um, agree with a lot of what Dan just said and, and so impressed with what both Rex and Dan presented about potential for discovery uh, in eMERGE using um, the EMR. Um, I do want to start off making the point that I think that it possibly may take even uh, more resources to fully utilize the data in the EMR to do the kind of discovery that um, we can do in, in clinical trials. Next slide. So uh, an example of this is uh, the example of uh, topoisomerase isomerase 2 inhibitors such as etoposide or anthocycline induced secondary leukemia. Um, this is a, an event that was discovered uh, over 20 years ago, and it can have as high of a frequency as 20% of patients treated with these drugs, uh, and it's uniformly fatal disease. So finding out the risk factors for this disease was critical. Next slide. And I want to give you an example of a, a protocol. So this is a clinical trial that randomized patients to two different schedules of exactly the same drug. So these patients get treated with weekly chemotherapy for 120 weeks. And the only difference between the patients randomized to ARM2 versus ARM3 was that ARM2 had the same pairs of drugs rotated every week, and ARM3 had the same pairs of drugs rotated every six weeks. Uh, so the cumulative doses over a two-year period of all of these drugs were absolutely identical. Next slide. But the frequency of secondary leukemia was much higher in the top curve in those who had the six-week blocks of drugs versus those who got the rotations every week. And I use this as an example to point out that if we're going to do things like survey EMRs for drug-related risk factors for adverse events, including fatal ones like this, looking at cumulative dose alone is not enough. Next slide. And the same thing was true in another uh, fatal adverse event, a secondary brain tumor in patients treated with leukemia. This slide depicts the frequency of secondary brain tumors in four different frontline clinical trials, those childhood ALL. They all went on for two and a half years, and they all had exactly the same dose of cranial irradiation, which is the primary risk factor that was known for development of secondary leukemia. But you can see in the top curve, this total 12 trial had a ridiculously high frequency of uh, severe um, fatal secondary brain tumors compared to the other trials, even though the dose of radiation was identical. Next slide. And we found actually a genetic feature in that study, a defect in TPMT, which you just heard about, which predisposed patients to develop this secondary brain tumor much worse than the patients who did not have an inherited defect in TPMT. Um, next slide. However, uh, these patients that have a defect in TPMT have always been around, and it's about 10% of the population that have that defect. So what was different about the total 12 study that made that genetic variant shine through and have its penetrant effect on this adverse drug effect that was not true in the other studies? Next slide. So by looking carefully at exactly what therapy was given per protocol uh, dur among these four protocols during the time period of irradiation, we could identify that it was uh, the degree of anti-metabolite intensity only during the two weeks of radiation that, that was different, about total 12, compared to the other studies that had a reasonably low level of secondary brain tumor. So again, an overall uh, chart review that looked at just cumulative doses of drugs or cumulative doses of irradiation never would have found this um, schedule-dependent uh, interaction that was a strong risk factor for this fatal complication. Next slide. Uh, and so here we have this interaction of host genetics only shining through with its uh, adverse event on a secondary brain tumor that was contributed to by the use of thiopurine uh, drugs during the cranial irradiation because of the unfortunate mixture of these drugs during the period of cranial irradiation. Very difficult 
to identify this kind of detailed um, drug therapy interaction from chart review alone. Next slide. So uh, I guess the point that I would make is that I think that the EMR data being accumulated by eMERGE is absolutely fantastic and unparalleled that the tools that will be needed to query it to come up with detailed information about schedule um, and timing of doses versus other interventions is probably going to take uh, even more resources. Um, now, as Dan just alluded to, the other point is, um, can you implement something if you don't already know that it works? Uh, next slide. And uh, we are, of course, looking at things like some of these pharmacogenetic gene drug pairs, which we've worked on with the CPIC, supported by the Pharmacogenomics Research Network. Right now, we've got about 13 genes affecting about 60 drugs that are affected by CPIC guidelines, and they are ready to implement uh, now. However, I definitely agree with Dan that uh, for rare variants in these genes, we don't know necessarily to implement them. And some of the data have been generated in um, ancestrally non-diverse groups, which would make implementation in all ancestral groups potentially problematic. Um, however, I do think that the, there has been a difference between doing implementation for that which one can with relatively common variants in well-studied ancestral groups and collecting new data, trying to find new associations between rare variants in those same genes uh, affecting those same um, 60, 60 drugs. Um, I do think that some of the trials ongoing, not necessarily in eMERGE, but elsewhere, where uh, patients are being randomized to have clinical implementation of genomics, especially pharmacogenomics versus not, are potentially problematic. Because when things are ready to implement, they should really be implemented. And it wouldn't really be ethical to withhold something that's ready to be implemented. Now, some sites are getting around this by sort of capitalizing on our unfortunate non-uniform healthcare system to uh, take advantage of natural randomizations where some sites can do genomic medicine and others can't. But that's really just an accident of our non-uniform healthcare system. And studies that purport to look at the effects of genomic medicine on clinical outcomes versus historical controls. I think really um, risk having the, all of the problems of poor study design coming up with misleading answers because the non-genetic clinical covariates are so critical in deciding whether something works or not that aren't controlled for in these studies are, are <clears throat> really a problem and can never be addressed by a historical control. Or, and that also affects, of course, these um, system randomizations. Next slide. So uh, I guess I would uh, just end there by saying that I think we have to, I think capitalizing in eMERGE on both discovery and on implementation, as it sounds as if you're doing, is a fantastic approach. But let's not mix up the two. When something is ready to implement, it's used as a clinical tool. And generating additional clinical outcome data may not be the best use of resources. If something's not ready to implement, it's worthy of clinical research, and eMERGE is better poised to do that than anyone. I'll stop there. Okay. With that, thank you. And uh, we'll...